So filming is filming. I guess they're filming by now. <coughs> so um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name's John. I'm from England in the sort of southwest pointy bit. Uh, and I'm going to talk about pair programming. And I've made a little bit of an effort to sort of uh, bring it back to XP, because after all, the the title of this uh, conference includes the words XP, which I believe was originally extreme programming. I'm a big fan of extreme programming. I see it making a comeback more and more in, technical, in the technical sense. Uh, I'm not going to talk about myself for ages. I'm freelance, sort of whatever the word these days is, consultant, stroke, mentor, teacher, coach, whatever it is. Uh, and probably I'm most proud of a charity I've set up. <coughs> I uh, encourage you to have a look at this, which is a site that enables you to practice programming in a team. So let's get started. Throughout the uh, slides, I'm going to occasionally use uh, quotes from books, <clears throat> and more or less most of them are from these three books here. This one I hope is familiar, again, about, the, uh, about XP. This is where it all started, first edition. Um, and I've put the dates of these three books at the top. And uh, I just wanted to draw your attention to this one, because uh, in doing the research for this talk, <clears throat> I, I uh, refound my love, is the best way to put it, for this particular book. This book, The Psychology of Computer Programming, I think it was actually published in 1971, but it was written in 1969 by a man called Jerry Weinberg. Sometimes you'll see his name as Jerry, and sometimes you'll see it as Gerald. I'm not quite sure what the story is there. Um, he was the project manager for Project Mercury for NASA, which was the project that had to get geostationary satellite tracking in place before you can't send rockets out into space and track them accurately unless you've got this, the right kit in place on Earth. And it turns out that was a real problem because until then they hadn't had to track things traveling that fast. So he was uh, heavily involved with Mercury and then also with Apollo. <clears throat> I don't know of a book about software that's been continuously in print longer than that book. It's an astonishing book, okay? I really urge you to read it. We'll see some clips from it as we go through and you can make your own mind up. So we'll start with a quote <clears throat> from The Psychology of Computer Programming, that, that very book. He says, a seldom questioned view of programming, a view which the book spends a great deal of time questioning, is the view that programming is an individual activity. And certainly when I visit places on my travels, across all cultures, <clears throat> by far the, the dominant way of programming is still an individual. One person, one keyboard, one computer, one monitor. Well, one monitor not so much these days. Two, three, four. The record I've seen is five, <laughs> okay? There were big monitors as well. <clears throat> so, um, that's what we're gonna do. We're not really, I'm not, not particularly going to home in on just the idea of pair programming. What I'd really like to expand the talk on is the idea of not programming on your own. All right? And pairing is obviously the simplest way of doing that, but if you pair in uh, twos, threes, fours, five, sixes, sevens, etc., it all still qualifies. That's really what I'm going to talk about. So pair programming is the way that most people associate not programming on your own. So here's two very famous pair programmers, Waldorf and Stadler from the Muppets, programming on a keyboard down here. The resolution of this project is pretty grainy, so I'm explaining some of the slides as I go, which is not ideal. Triple programming. Yeah, I've had occasion to do this a few times. I remember one occasion in particular in Oslo with a really fantastic company, which uh, was the first European acquisition of Cisco. They got bought out. Uh, um, the situation there was that there was a guy who was expert in MATLAB, and he'd written an algorithm in MATLAB, but it was too slow. So I was second in the chain, and I had to convert the MATLAB code into C. But even that was too slow. So the third guy in the chain uh, was a guy called Lars, and he was one of the, if not the, world expert on optimizing assembler for the Intel chips. <clears throat> so I would write the code in, this, in, in C, and he would say, no, 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 don't write it in C like that. Write it like this instead in all this non-idiomatic way of programming in C, like don't pass the arguments by pointer, just make copies of them. And I'm saying, that's going to be slow, making all this copy of all this data. He said, trust me, I know how the compiler works under the hood. And he was absolutely right. 
And it worked absolutely beautifully. <clears throat> and another one that's becoming more and more common these days, anyone come across the term mob programming? Hands up if you've heard the term mob programming. Again, some interesting stuff for you there if you want to do a bit of research after the talk. This is gaining quite a lot of traction. There's a man called Woody Zool with a slightly unusual spelling of Zool. Do you know how they spell Zool P? I don't know either. Okay, you, you can look it up. Uh, and this, again, caught my eye in particular because <clears throat> I happened to, through various set of circumstances, know Jerry Weinberg a little bit. So I emailed him. And there's a, a little uh, interesting story I'd like to recount. It started from this paper. There's a paper uh, written by two gentlemen, uh, Craig Larman and Baz Vodily. I think I said that right. I probably got his pronounced it wrong. But they wrote a paper which was looking, as you can almost see there, the history of iterative programming. They wanted to find the earliest documented case of iterative programming. So uh, it appeared in a journal. I forget exactly what the journal was. But it's also available as a PDF, which you can look at if you want to. Uh, and Jerry Weinberg, who's now an old, old man, 1960s was Project Mercury and NASA, uh, in, the, in the PDF, he says, we were doing incremental development as early as 1957, where the tech used was, as far as I could tell, indistinguishable from XP, and that caught my eye, because obviously with the XP connection there. <clears throat> so I was interested in that, and I emailed him to try and expand a little bit on this idea of what do you mean it was indistinguishable from XP? And I was particularly pressing him on the idea of pair programming, because I knew I was going to do this talk. And he said something which revealed my ignorance. OK? Because if you think about 1957, you might sort of get a clue about what's coming up. And he replied with a lovely email, and some of it was this. He said, we worked with punched cards and printouts. With a turnaround time of a week or so, we air freighted the decks of cards from New York to Los Angeles. Right? <laughs> it wasn't a case of two people working at one computer. They didn't have a computer. <laughs> right? They had to do mob programming because there was no computer. They all programmed together, literally in a mob, to make their decks of punch cards. And every week, they'd bundle them up and then send them by air freight from New York, where they were based, to Los Angeles. And the effect of this, if you think about it, was you made pretty damn sure that the deck of cards that you collectively as a team built in one week came back correct. Because if it didn't come back correct, you knew you had another whole week to go around the cycle of fixing it. Yeah? And that, if you think about it, is a really fantastic way of constraining your environment to give you iterative development. You'd soon learn to choose an increment of functionality that you can fit really confidently in one increment. And that's what they did. Okay? They came, there were all kinds of problems they had. One of the biggest problems they had wasn't the code was wrong. It was that the, type, the typists, because the typists in those days typed the code into the punched cards, and they would make transcription errors. So they had to get rid of the typists and do the transcriptions themselves as part of the mob activity with all kinds of checking. So I thought that was very interesting. That's my reminder to me, because I tend to lose my voice when I'm doing these talks. The water reminds me to have a drink of water. Oh, I can feel my, <clears throat> my throat getting dry already. I love fishing. Fishing is my hobby and my passion. That's the biggest salmon I've caught so far. Fishing on the fly. Fishing on the fly. Whoopsie, what happened there? Don't know what happened there. Pressed the wrong button. Let's get back. OK, now, in my experience, <clears throat> if you ask a group, well, let's try it. If, who's uh, never pair programmed? Hands up if you've never pair programmed, ever. OK, fair enough. <clears throat> now, I say, I say that's probably a lie. I think quite a few of you have never pair programmed, but haven't put your hands up. Or maybe you have, but perhaps not in the way that I intended. <clears throat> because my experience is that even people who say, they don't pair program, do pair program instinctively in one particular situation. Anyone guess what that situation might be? No? No? You have to speak up. I can't hear. There's a fan going. Patterns, no? No, close though. 
You do it instinctively. You're so instinctive, you probably don't realize you're doing it. Right. If you've been programming away for a quarter of an hour, half an hour, an hour, two hours, a morning, a day, a week, and you're not, you've got the same problem that you can't get over, yeah, unless you're really inexperienced and particularly dense, what you're instinctively going to do is say, what's your name, sorry? Salah. Salah, could you have a look at this for me? I, I, can't, I know I'm being stupid. I can't see what the problem is. Help me out a minute. Could you come over here and we'll look at this program together? And we come down and we sit down and we look at the program. And I start explaining the problem to you. And what happens then? Right. You haven't said anything. I've just been talking to you saying, this is the problem. I've been having this problem for a week. I just can't figure out what it was. And then bingo, I see something that I didn't see before. Right? People instinctively know that. The, the real art is judging how far you struggle not making progress on your own before you have the awareness to say, well, hang on, it's probably better here if I actually grab someone else's help in some way, shape, or form. You do it kind of instinctively at many levels. If you can't figure something out, you Google, right? And that's an interesting, again, play. If you think about Jerry Weinberg, 1957, a week's turnaround, they didn't have things like Google, all right? <clears throat> So people instinctively pair when they're debugging, if they're smart. This is a term, a known term. You can look it up on Wikipedia. <clears throat> it's called rubber duck debugging. Because the point is, with the best will in the world, I don't actually need another human being. I can make do with a duck. As long as I speak to the duck, the same effect will manifest itself, OK? Most of the time. Genuinely, it genuinely works. Okay, it's a known phenomenon. It's also sometimes called the cardboard engineer. That's another phrase you might hear it as sometimes. I can have a cardboard cutout of Bjorn Struestrup if I'm programming in C++, or a cardboard cutout of Dennis Ritchie if I'm programming in C or whatever. Okay, tell them the problem. A lot of the time, it will really help. People have done studies looking at brain activity when you perform activity silently, and when you perform them verbalizing your thoughts as you go, completely different patterns. They didn't discover this deliberately. It was accidental. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's a qualitative difference. It's not just a quantitative difference. It literally changes the way you think when you have to verbalize your thinking with another human being or a duck. OK? <clears throat> now, if, if, if pairing works when you're debugging and you're trying to get yourself out of the hole, and it does. The natural question to ask is, does it work in other situations? More situations, rather than just sort of leaving it to the end when you've got this problem, yeah? <clears throat> well, that's a question you won't be surprised to hear that quite a few people have investigated. Kent Beck himself is very clear in, in the book, the white book. He says, in my experience, pair programming is more productive than dividing the work between two programmers and then having to integrate the results. Yeah? And I agree with that. <clears throat> but that's just his opinion. Are there any, is there any data to back it up? Has anyone done any studies on this, proper studies, as it were? And the answer is, of course, yes. There's a study called Strengthening the Case for Pair Programming. Again, it's on the web. You can find it if you want. You might recognize some of the authors. Quite famous, again, from early XP circles. Laurie Williams is one of the authors of the middle book, the yellow book, with the tobogganists on the front. She's very interested in pair programming as well. <clears throat> so let's take the results of this particular study from the bottom up. First one, not to d sort of lower the importance of this. I think enjoying what you do is tremendously important. <clears throat> Most of the programmers who were pairing enjoyed actually programming collaboratively. They actually enjoyed it more than working on your own. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that if you enjoy what you do, you're going to be better at what you do. Yeah. <clears throat> the pairs consistently implemented the same functionality in fewer lines of code. That's a massive win, because software is non-linear. Yeah, if I've got 100 lines of code here and 200 lines of code here, this 200 lines of code is more than twice as complicated as this 100 lines of code, because software is non-linear. Okay? The resulting code had about 15% fewer defects. These are all good things. But the pairs spent about 15% more time than programming, uh, uh, than the, on the programming tasks <clears throat> than the individuals. Now, that's a fairly close result, if you think about it, because we're talking about programmer hours here, not elapsed time. 
Yeah? So it was almost the case that the pairs did it in half the time, but not quite, because again, there was a 15% discrepancy. Yeah? Now, for, personally, if I, even if I knew about this and this was the case, which is questionable, as we'll see in a minute, I would still, as a program manager, very strongly insist, <clears throat> if I was managing a team, that the default mode of development was pairing rather than the default being individual for lots of reasons, basically summarized as the idea that pair programming is mostly about the pair and less about the programming. You've got to do the programming, but you have to try and instill some way of moving beyond the pr bunch of people who are programming as individuals, and they're all sort of pointing in different directions. And if you take the vector sum of all those people, you get a very tiny little direction in there, okay? No, you want to think about making the group of people collectively work as a team, a single team, so they're all pointing in the same direction. And all, again, doing a sort of analogy, the vector sum all roughly points in the same direction, but even if it's only roughly in the same direction, you add them all up, you get a big velocity going in a certain direction. That's the, in my experience, traveling the world, that's the difference between developers doing really good stuff and other teams which are a team in name only. Yeah, number one, a bunch of individuals not working as a team. Number two, a bunch of programmers working as one team. It's very clear when you see it with experience over time, because I'm getting quite old now, I'm 32 years old, but that is in hex, okay? Very clear. But as I said, even that's questionable, because another study, uh, to another university in America by this particular gentleman, did a perhaps a more realistic study. They studied 15 full-time experienced programmers, yeah? working for 45 minutes on a challenging problem that was important to them, in, and they were doing it in their own environment with their own equipment. So this is set up to be as realistic as we could make it, as he could make it, okay? What did he find? <clears throat> Let's just explain clearly what we're talking about here. The five of them worked individually, that was the control group, and then 10 people worked in pairs. So there was five individuals and five pairs. Again, that's the way I'd have done it, yeah? Conditions and materials used were exactly the same <clears throat> for both groups. All the teams outperformed the individual pro programmers, enjoyed the whole thing more, and had a greater confidence in their solutions, and again, less time, less code and less time. But this time, notice 40%. 40% is less than 50%, so the pairs actually completed the task in less person hours than the individuals. So it took less time, you had higher quality, fewer lines of code, they enjoyed it more, <clears throat> and you had pairing, which was starting to get the team working as a team rather than a bunch of individuals. Okay? Proper study. So this naturally begs the question, if pairing is productive, and I genuinely believe it is, it is the de it, for me, it's the default way of working. It should be the default working way of working. Why isn't it? Why is it still the case that programming is rare? Anyone got any ideas? <laughs> Go on. Well, that's a strong claim. <laughs> sure, they, they, you can get people who don't want to be part of a team, to put it bluntly, right? Yeah, that's the style that the team uses for coding. That's the way we lay out our code, something simple like layout, where do you put your braces? And then here's this programmer, Jeff. Jeff does it differently. We've tried to persuade Jeff to code the way the rest of the team works. Jeff does it differently, okay? No, he doesn't. Not on my team, okay? That's a really serious problem that you've got there. It's just manifesting itself in one particular way. And again, if you read XP edition one, Kent is very, very clear about it. He talks about that exact situation. He says, if you want to program in this XP team, we'd love to have you on. You have to follow the rules of the team. Okay, it's not about you. You know, you, you don't own the code. The company owns the code, right? Unless you work for yourself, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so there's, I agree, there are lots of reasons, but there's one reason above all else why pairing isn't more common, and you're not going to like it. And the reason is, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, 
Now that sounds silly, but actually there's a deep truth here. There's a deep truth here. And again, it's, it's something that Jerry Weinberg talks about very lucidly in the book, Psychology of Computer Programming from 1969. Okay? He says, there's a term called locking from social psychology, and it occurs whenever a situation creates an environment favorable for maintaining a certain situation. Yeah? There's a certain situation, and for whatever reason, it locks into a certain way of actually behaving. Right? So why is it, for example, that on England we drive on the left-hand side of the road, and in other countries like America, they drive on the wrong side of the road? Right? <laughs> Who knows? There's all kinds of theories about why that is, but for some reason, and in this case it's fairly easy to see the benefits of locking, right? Because you don't want half the people driving on one half of the road and half the people driving on the other half of the road. It naturally locks itself to a certain behavior. It's a self-reinforcing behavior. Okay, reminds me of a true story about a, a very small country in Africa, whose name I forget, that uh, decided they were going to switch from driving on the left to driving on the right, a bit like Sweden did one time. Okay, and uh, when asked how they were going to do it, their answer was gradually. <laughs> so, people program on their own because that's the default. And all kinds of behaviors then lock to that default, right? Creating a situation that makes it hard to move away from that situation. For example, do you have people that have different keyboards? More and more and more on my travels, I find a group of developers who are multicultural. Yeah? For example, the team in Oslo, there was someone from Egypt, there was someone from Norway, a few people from Norway, there were a few people from England, there was a couple of people from India, I could go on, okay? They were all given the freedom to choose whichever keyboard they liked. They all had different keyboards. Again, you're optimizing the individual behavior, you're not optimizing the team behavior. You can prove that if you optimize the parts of a system, you will pessimize the whole. You can prove that, okay? Systems theory. You can prove, and the other way around works the same. You can prove that a system is at its most efficient when the individual parts of that system are not at the most efficient. And again, at some level, we instinctively know this, right? What's the most efficient way you can have a motorway? All the cars jammed into the motorway. What's the net result? No one can move. You've got a traffic jam. You have to have a bit of space between the cars. You have to have slack in the system so that it's optimized at the whole level to allow everything to work, okay? It's the way things work. Different editors. That was rife. Simple things like the table design. I was at a company a couple of weeks ago, and I always try and pair when I visit companies because what I have learned from experience is that if you talk to the managers, they'll say, this is the way we develop software. And then you go and actually sit with the developers, and then what you discover is how they actually develop the software, right? And nine times out of 10, they're very different. So I sat with this guy, nice guy, Ben, but by God, it was hard fitting together because we were in the corner of the room and all the stuff was on the outside of the room. We happened to be in the corner. Whereas the second team <coughs> on the floor up, they'd arranged their layout of the tables and chairs differently. They had all the tables and chairs in the middle of the room. Yeah, so it was very easy to fit people around if you wanted more than two people at a keyboard. Simple things like that, okay? Number of computers. Thinking about Jerry again? No computer. They had to work as a team. So again, if I was running a group of developers, I'd be very t seriously tempted to just remove computers. Right? Constrain the environment to try and make things happen the way you want to happen, okay? Tools. That's one that often gets overlooked. When you git commit, for example, is the git set up so that the number of users set up for that git commit is one user or more than one user? One user. If you want to make it actually know two users with two usernames and two email addresses, that what are the names you'd like associated with this commit, it's quite difficult. You have to really try quite hard to persuade Git to do that. You think, oh, I'm not going to bother. Again, locking, 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 locking. All these situations conspiring to reinforce the status quo. Okay? We could go on. So, a very first little tip. If you are going to pair, don't allow people to choose their own pairs because they'll lock, right? They'll only pair with the people they get on with, and that's not what you want. You're optimizing the parts rather than the system, okay? Make everything fair, 
Everyone has to pair <clears throat> at random. You can even get someone to write a little program that chooses the pairs at random, okay? That's the way I do it. <laughs> oh. Okay. <clears throat> now, I actually did this test the last time I was here. I was here, was it two or three years ago? I forget. Thank you. Were you there? Can you remember the answer? <laughs> the, my, the XP test is a test I do to places that say they're doing XP. I say, pretend I'm an alien, I've just arrived, and you're telling me you're doing this thing called XP. Well, I don't know what that means, it's just two letters to me. Tell me what do you actually mean by XP. Yeah? And then I let them explain the thoughts that are in their head when they have to describe XP. So when I put that question to you, what thoughts popped into your head? What's the first thing that popped into your head individually when you think about XP? Anyone got any suggestions? It's extreme. That's the X. Okay, anything else? Shout them out. Right? Fantastic. Anything else? Say again, sorry? Creativity? Windows. <laughs> well, with one exception at the back, who may have been primed slightly, Pete at the back there, because I was talking to him this morning. Um, what I find in, in practice is that almost never the people who say they're doing XP tell me about the values of XP. Right? If you read Kent's book, edition one and edition two, it's very clear, if you read it and think about it as you're reading it, that the whole of the XP practices, such as pair programming, are built on a foundation of four values. But yet they cannot tell you what those values are. Not surprising they're not really understanding and getting the full benefit of XP, okay? So that's my test to them. Once we've started on that road, I say to them, okay, I'll give you a help, I'll try and help you along. Do you at least even know the four values? Well, almost invariably at this point, they might know one or two, if we're lucky. But they certainly don't know the lesser known ones, even though that's sort of a tautology. <laughs> Anyone know any of the four values of XP? There was actually a fifth one added in XP too. Communication, that's the one that people remember, first of all, yeah, fantastic. Simplicity. Courage, respect, it was added in edition two. I'm impressed. Feedback, we got the full set. Yeah, hey. <clears throat> and courage in particular, which was the one that Pete said, this surprises people. They think, no, 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 no that can't be right. It's a technical book. XP's about technical practices. Can't have something sort of soft and whooshy and sort of social. This courage, no, no, no. But it's right there. And, and I didn't get this first of all. I have to have my hands up. When I first read the first edition, I did exactly the same. I just was looking at it from the technical practices point of view. A friend clued me up. He said, read it again. But this time, think about the values as you do it. And I did, and it really helped. It re I can't tell you how much it helped me get value from that book when I read it the second time. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these, <clears throat> mostly courage, in terms of Again, pair programming in particular, because again, pair programming is mostly about the pairing. It's not so much about the programming. If you understand the pairing aspect of it, you'll see how the aspect of pairing is quite insidious. It affects lots and lots of other aspects of extreme programming, okay? such as communication. So again, from the white book, Kent's book, <coughs> XP is a communal software development discipline. It's about trying to get a group of people working as a team not all pointing in different directions, okay? Pair programming works for XP because it encourages communication, assuming they talk to each other, right? <laughs> and to state the kind of obvious, what's, what's common about communication and communal? They're the same Latin root, it's about community, right? This is what it's about at its heart. And in the, uh, the second book, the yellow book by Laurie Williams, she points out something we can't argue with. Most people resist transitioning to pair programming. That's partly the locking, okay? 
The system wants you to p not pair because at the moment you're not pairing. But, but okay, you want to pair, but even then you'll find it difficult because it involves breaking old habits. Old habits are difficult to break. They're habits, right? And partly it's not just about the habits, it's about this sort of meta thing about being more communicative. Yeah? Without wanting to stereotype, I think there is some truth in the sort of idea that the stereotype developer is someone who is a loner, if you want to put it that way. That certainly used to be more true. I, w I see that becoming less and less true as time progresses. Certainly when I was at university, everything I did was marked as an individual. But more and more on my travels, I find uh, developers who are working in a, in a team, and when they were at university, they were, some of their assessments were done as part of a team. And the whole team got marked collectively for the work they did as a team because the universities quite sensibly are trying to mimic the real situation that occurs in industry, okay? We're trying to increase communication. Feedback is the next one. Again from Jerry Weinberg. 1969, it is a well-known psychological principle that in order to maximize the rate of learning, the subject must be fed back information on how well or poorly he or she is doing. So again, to kind of state the obvious, feedback isn't feedback unless it's fed back, right? And actually alters your path in some way, yeah? If you're working on your own, <clears throat> even if you've got things like Google, your your bandwidth for learning is quite low because of this. This is a really great book, not one of the three at the beginning. It's called Switch by Two Brothers. It's from, uh, from America, but don't let that put you off. <laughs> we are all lousy self-evaluators, okay? And, and the important word here isn't really lousy. I think really I should have highlighted the other word, self. Because in a, in a funny kind of way, you're the best person to evaluate your behavior because you're always there, right? You can always see what you're doing. But on the other hand, you're the worst person to evaluate your behavior because you don't get an objective view, right? You, ha you're, you see the world through rose-colored spectacles. You think you're better than you are. You think you're a better programmer than you are. Maybe you were five years ago, but times have moved on. Have you kept up, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then the next one is courage which we're going to, as I said, spend a little bit of time on. <clears throat> First of all, let's remind ourselves what courage is, because in my experience there's sometimes confusion about this. The absence of fear is not courage. The absence of fear in a dangerous, threatening situation is some kind of brain damage, right? It's perfectly normal to be fearful if there's something that is to be feared. Courage is moving on despite the fear. Yeah, and the question is, where do you get that courage from? And I think there's a very strong case to say you'll get that courage more if there are two of you and you're working together rather than your default mode of programming being working individually, okay? But it's not just me that says this. Kent Beck talks about, again, this same point. <clears throat> if people program solo, pardon the pun, they are more likely to make mistakes. We saw that earlier. They're more likely to over-design, partly because they just don't know simpler ways of doing it, right? They only know their way of doing it. They're more likely to blow off other practices, particularly under pressure. And again, let's just focus on that for a moment, because for me, a process is something that you want to help you work, and you want it to help you most when you're in the most danger, right? What you don't want is a process but when things get tough and things get difficult, you chuck the process away and you just start hacking, right? Why have a process? Yeah, you, you kind of missed the point. So you want something that works under pressure. And is your process going to work under pressure? My answer is it doesn't really make any difference what the process is. Whether it'll work or not is outside of that. Whether it'll work or not is how you've set up the social dynamics of the situation. I genuinely believe that, okay? It's not an accident, for example, that Scrum doesn't have role names. If you're a team member, then your title is team member, right? Again, it's the same idea of trying to get everyone working as a collective team. And I'd like to tell you a particularly, for me, inspiring 
example of this. And this is uh, probably one of the most famous experiments in social psychology by this man here called Solomon Ash. Bit of a wordy title. Studies of independence and submission to group pressure, a minority of one against a unanimous majority. I'll talk you through it. Very simple, elegant experiment. There's three cards, uh, three lines on a card labeled A, B, and C, and all you have to do is say whether this line is the same length as A, B, or C. Okay? Now, the trick is that there's eight people, and they all think they're doing the experiment, but only one of them is actually being experimented on. Seven of them are actually in on the experiment, okay? The black sheep, <coughs> as it were. Yeah? They do 18 trials. How does a trial work? The trial works by showing the cards, and then each person has to say whether the line is the same as A, B, or C. Okay, thank you. So A, 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 A. Everyone says A, and then we get to the actual person who's doing the, we're doing the experiment on, okay, and they say A, because it's A. There's, no, there's nothing going on here. It is A, everyone said A. And then we do another round, another pair of cards, B, 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 and you say B, it's B. Okay, and then the actual experiment starts. Another set of cards, and the art that it's obvious that C is the right one. All right, completely obvious that C is the right one. But everyone who's in on the experiment, you go C C A A A C C A A A A A A A A A, and then they say A. They, they, I mean, it's C. They're looking, they're rubbing their glasses, and thinking, really, right? Yeah. But there's this peer pressure, and nearly everyone has said A. In fact, everyone, everyone has said A, okay? They set it up, so everyone says A, because remember the title, unanimous, okay? That's how it works. <clears throat> and we also have a little bit of the details about how often they give the wrong answer, because occasionally they'll put one back in and everyone gives the right answer, okay? The subject under trial, the one subject, conformed to the incorrect answer in all of the trials 36% of the time. Yeah, and 70% of the time, they gave at least the, the wrong answer at least one time, which tells us nothing very surprising. There is strong peer pressure to follow the group, okay? Now, quite a few people know this experiment. This is a fairly well-known experiment, but what people are not so familiar with is that he did a follow-up. He did two follow-ups, actually. And in, this, in the first follow-up, <clears throat> it's exactly the same setup but one of the white sheep, one of the confederates, gives the right answer. So two cards again, A, B, C, and it's obviously B, okay? And C, 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 B, C, 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 C. So it's exactly the same as before, except previously everyone had given the wrong answer, creating this universal pressure to give the wrong answer. But now one person gave the right answer, okay? Makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, it decreased conformity to the incorrect answer by 75%. Right? This is the difference of an individual and just having one confederate. Thinking, oh, I'm not on my own. There's at least someone else who thinks it's a C. <laughs> okay? I love this experiment. I think it's really powerful. It shows the power of example rather than the example of power. Okay? Programmers admit to working harder, smarter on programs because they don't want to let their partner down. When they're working in a pair, there is this sense of working as two people. There's a social dynamic that you're creating as a pair, okay? What's the oldest bug? I should explain what I mean by this. How long, is, how long have you tried to debug one bug? A year? Did someone say a year? Really? That's amazing. <laughs> Did you find it? <laughs> is it like today is one year, we're still going? <laughs> yeah? And are you always doing this on your own, or have you got someone to help you sometimes? Right. Wow, okay. I have a friend, Mike, who um, him and his friend spent seven months working nine to five doing nothing except trying to track one bug down. And they found the bug, and 
in that particular situation, they had lost the source code, they only had the assembler, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it was only through a matter of luck that they were able to refactor the source code, the assembler source code, to get the same functionality in one fewer opcode to give them the space to put a jump code in and actually patch the error. But they could have spent seven months finding the bug and then not have been able to do anything about it. Okay? That's the longest one. I, I used to be the longest one I knew about, okay? So if you're in a bad situation, follow the words of Churchill, right? If you're going through hell, keep going. Going through hell is difficult when you're going on your own. Okay? So again, try and have this awareness of when it's useful to not be on your own. Oh. Okay. So to finish up, I just sort of collected some random thoughts together. <coughs> There's something called the truck or bus number. Anyone come across that term? Yeah, a few, one, two, three. Uh, basically, how if we took a piece of source code, <coughs> one module, let's say, uh, and we asked the 10 developers, <coughs> who really understands this particular piece of source code, and one person says, yes, I do, then what tends to happen in those situations is, number one, you get locking. Because when there's a piece of work to be done on that particular module, guess who gets it, right? The person who knows it, because they can do the work fastest. They're bored by it, because they can do it easily. It doesn't give them a challenge. Dangerous situation to be in. I could tell you a few stories there, but I'm going to run out of time. But essentially, the truck number is one in that situation. And the point is, if that person gets hit by a bus, they may not die, but they're in hospital with their leg in traction or whatever, okay? and you've got some work to do on that module, oh dear, right? Because all your knowledge about how to work on that module just walked out the door and it's going to be in hospital for six months. So you want to try and spread the knowledge of the system around the developers. And again, it's this idea of optimizing the whole team of developers as a team and not optimizing the parts. Because it seems like the best way to get the most efficient code being produced by your team of developers is to have each of them working on their own specialties. <clears throat> except when it goes wrong. And then when it goes wrong, it goes wrong badly. And again, we've got the process degenerating rather than helping us, okay? I mentioned this to some friends in Norway, and they said, ah, oh, yes, we know about this, but we call it something different. <laughs> and I love this because they have an optimistic view rather than a pessimistic view. If you look, talk about this anywhere except the Scandinavian countries, it's called the truck number or the bus number, and it's talking about what happens if someone gets hit by a bus, <laughs> right? Or a truck. But they said, no, it's much more likely that they're going to win the lottery. <laughs> Same effect, right? All the knowledge walks out the door. In fact, it's worse. Because in places I visited, all the development team are in a syndicate, right? And if any of them win the lottery, they're all going to win big time, and the whole team is going to walk out the door, right? <laughs> Same effect, bad risk. Interruptions. A pair. Working together is tremendously resistant to interruptions. Yeah, if you know how programmers work, you've got this mental sort of keepy-uppy. You've got all these things you're thinking about, keeping them up in the air, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, and then your manager comes in and says, John, that stuff you said that was going to be ready Friday week, is it going to be ready Friday week? <laughs> Notice how they set the question up, right? <laughs> yeah? And you say, uh, what? What was the question? That stuff, Friday week, is it going to be ready? Oh, yeah, 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 it's going to be ready. You think, is it going to be ready? Anyway. And then all the balls you've been keeping in the air on the floor. And it takes you another quarter of an hour to get back where you were because you've been pulled out of the flow. But if you're in a pair, right, again, you've got a natural way of being resistant to that because one person's driving and one person's the navigator, and the navigator naturally acts as a sort of buffer. Okay? Interviewing. This is a quote from Edwards Deming. <coughs> Teamwork characteristics cannot be determined if you interview one at a time. Simple, obvious, right? If you interview people one at a time, and you never see in the interview how they work in a team-based environment, you've got no clue about how they're going to work in a team-based environment. You've got the locking situation again, OK? So several companies I've suggested this to, Ericsson for one, to mention another Scandinavian company, that now have adopted this. Okay, when they interview, rather than interviewing one person on Monday, one person on Tuesday, one person on Wednesday, one person on Thursday, one person on Friday, they get them all in on one day, 
five people, and they get five people out of the development team, and they pair them up one by one, and then they rotate every so often, and at the end of the day, every developer has seen every protective pers pers prospective candidate at least once, and they get a much better idea of how good the candidates are, not just technically, but socially. And you've also got a dynamic of trying to get things happening in a team-based situation rather than, again, this individual, okay? This is another quote I love. I'm big on practice. Deliberate practice is what CyberDojo is all about. Uh, there's an American basketball coach called John Wooden, and he coached uh, a number of teams, and the teams that he coached still hold the record for the longest unbeaten run in American basketball. They hold several other records as well. Okay? If you're interested in uh, quality practice, I urge you to get some of the stuff that he's talked about and he's, uh, he's written. This is a book called Wooden on Leadership. He says, I felt it was unwise to allow the players to practice individually. I always wanted them to be practicing with their teammates, is basically what he says. And I'm totally, completely on, uh, with him on that one. Consistency. We talked about all the developers except Jeff programming in a certain style. Yeah, that's kind of a reflection of Conway's law, if you know Conway's law. The question is, if, it's, if you've got a dynamic where that's not happening, how do you start to get it back on the right track? Okay. <clears throat> the obvious answer is you get the people pairing, and as long as you switch the pairs periodically, you've now got a way that hopefully, in a reasonably short time, space of time, will <clears throat> end up with a consistent style, which is, again, a reflection of the fact it's now a team. Yeah, if you've got half the code base written in one style and half the code base written in one style, two styles, you haven't got one team. You've got two teams. We might have one team in name, but you've got two teams, okay? You want one team, one style. You want consistency. And again, this is what's borne out from the experiments. Scaling. Scrum Guide says, it's a quote, having more than nine members requires too much coordination. Very well known, so Scrum says you can't have a team bigger than nine. But notice their units are individuals. What about if you have a team of nine pairs and everyone has to pair all the time? That's a way of doubling your scaling, and I think you'd have a very good chance of minimizing the bad effects of extra communication that would ensue. Okay? So to summarize a couple of slides, <clears throat> it's about the team. Pairing is just the way that you break the dynamic of everyone working individually. It's the simplest, most effective way of breaking the dynamic of everyone just working individually so that you can start to have the team working as one team, okay? Widespread use of pair programming involves a cultural shift. It's again, you're trying to break the locking. The locking has set the culture in place. Culture, by definition, is hard to change. We're trying to move the organization away from a culture of individuality and towards a culture of team recognition and goals. And to finish off, we'll have a quote from Jerry. He uses the word egoless programming, which is a well-known term that he invented. He, says, he said in a blog post recently, he wished he'd actually used less ego rather than egoless. Okay? But basically, if this idea of the programmer's understanding that the code isn't their code, it's the owned by the company that they're working for, okay, yeah, then everyone in the group will have the chance to examine <coughs> the work of everyone else at some time. And this, again, as a dynamic, helps to prevent the establishment of a strong hierarchy, which is, again, yet another way of saying we've got a team. We don't have a hierarchy. We've got everyone in the same team. It's all ways of saying the same thing. Okay. So that's all I had lined up. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Not too bad. Maybe a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Yep. was a different experience. Mm -hmm. For example, one developer is less experienced and another one is more experienced right. and they work uh, in pair. Right. How to how to evaluate uh, their um, performance? Because every time uh, we will have uh, work that will be done by the more experienced developer. It sounds to me like the, what you're saying is in that situation, if we didn't have the pair, we could go faster because the experienced developer could get this stuff done on their own. And the fact that the less experienced developer is with them is probably just slowing them down somewhat, right? Absolutely agree. 
This is another example of optimizing the parts of the system which naturally will pessimize the whole system. That way leads you down to high truck numbers, for example, right? Okay? <clears throat> the really, really good teams understand at the team level and at an individual level that if you are an experienced member of the team, part of your job in this culture is to pass on the cultural values of the team to the new members of the team. Right? This is what we do here. When you came to do the interview, you paired. And now we're coding, we're pairing. What did you expect? Right? Okay? It's the same message being played. It's just a sa another example of the same thing. Um, but the point is uh, to it is business. So um, let's say I can do my work in uh, two hours and go home. And uh, you are doing your work in eight hours and stay over time uh, because you are less experienced. And uh, in case we are pairing programming, then I am doing my task because you cannot help me at this point, and then we are going to program on your task. Well, there's two thoughts. There's so three, there's, yeah, uh, there's much a number of thoughts programming, there. Programmer does much coding, and uh, uh, okay, uh, this uh, like a junior developer right. does less coding, and uh, he's learning, but actually this senior programmer does more work. Well, again, my, my experience is that if you've got a team that functions well as a team, everything will actually go faster. It's an illusion. It's a strong illusion. And a manager who just sees programming productivity in terms of how fast are people typing, OK, <laughs> is going to look at that pair and say, oh, I could double the productivity by giving them two keyboards because now we're typing twice as fast, OK? No, in my experience, that's n bottleneck. The, the bottleneck is not typing. There's other factors to consider in the dynamic, OK? So I would question the assumption that it's going to make things slower, right? The second thought that popped into my mind was a lot of places I visit have the same sort of basic mentality as developers, and they say, well, we kind of like to try this idea, but we think our bosses really won't like it, all right? And I speak to the bosses, and, I, and they say, well, no, no, no. If, they wanna, if they're going to do something and it makes them more productive, why the hell am I going to say no, right? And there's this, for whatever reason, there's this cultural divide that's been built up between the developers and the managers because they're not talking to each other. Communication again, right? Okay. And actually, if the developers just had a bit of courage, right, and when they thought they were going to do some pairing, they did some pairing, I think everything would probably just be fine. It's the old chestnut of it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, right? Um, and there was a thought, a third thought that popped into my head, but it's but it's gone for the moment. Okay. Oh yes. The, the assumption that we've got a junior developer working on their own for eight hours to produce shit, <laughs> right? No, that's not the way I'd run it. <laughs> I particularly want the junior developers paired up with something more experienced so they don't produce rubbish and feel they're under time pressure to get even more rubbish done even more quickly. Are they and you've got a locking situation pushing you in the wrong dynamic, okay? Any other questions? Because you've nicked a few there. <laughs> yeah, no. um, my name is Boris. Thank Hi. you, John. Uh, the question is, um, a shift to a pair programming is kind of changing the lane, right? Changing the? Changing the lane, you drive yes. the team. Uh, so the question is, is there a gradual way to change the lane? <laughs> or is it? That is an excellent question. Yeah. There, is, there probably is. There, there, there certainly are gradual ways of uh, making the shift. Um, for example, just assuming you can do it and assuming you've got permission rather than asking for, uh, just ask, uh, doing it and the forgiveness rather than permission, okay? Courage. But I'm reminded of um, a developer called Johannes Brodval, fantastic developer. Seems to skit around a, blade, a bit. He used to be in Norway. I think he was in Sri Lanka. I think he's back in Sweden now. And he's been the tech lead manager for th three or four teams now. And when he starts as a tech lead stroke manager for a new team, he's pretty ruthless and authoritarian at the start. He says, in this team, we do an XP, everyone pairs all the time. You've got no choice. If you don't like it, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. You can go and work somewhere else, right? It's not your choice. It's a company decision. This is the way we work. And what he said in every single case so far, all the developers bitched and whined and moaned for a couple of weeks, saying it's not fair, all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah? Yeah? And then, after two weeks, things started to change, right? 
And he, if you have the courage of your convictions, and in his case he did, they set the wheels in motion, and after two weeks, and they got over that sort of speed bump in the road, right? They all, with one exception in one of the teams, every single developer, it was unanimous, they would not go back to programming on their own. They absolutely preferred programming in pairs, okay? So I think the best way is just to enforce it, to be honest, and accept that people are going to bitch and whine and moan, okay? No, it's not a gradual way. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks.